In 2010, the Bears were so close to earning a trip to the Super Bowl, they even hosted the NFC Championship. Unfortunately, their quarterback Jay Cutler got injured, and backup Caleb Haney just couldn't do enough to win. Entering the offseason, there were so many questions surrounding the team, and none more prominent than what to do with Jay Cutler. Cutler was acquired by the Bears in 2009. Before that, he was a Bronco, and not a bad potential franchise quarterback either. In 2007, he had nearly 3,500 yards, 20 touchdowns, and 14 picks in his first full season as a starter. He even improved his next season, throwing for 4,500 yards, 25 touchdowns, and 18 picks. So why did Denver get rid of him? One name. Josh McDaniels. At the conclusion of the 2008 season, after missing the playoffs for the third straight year, the club fired head coach Mike Shanahan. Denver decided to hire longtime Patriots staff member Josh McDaniels as their next top man, looking to steal some wisdom from the best team in football over the entire decade. Here's the problem, Josh McDaniels is an awful head coach. He is never prepared, doesn't seem to adjust game plans well, and uh, uh what else? Oh yeah, has the biggest ego of all time. The man is a god, at least according to himself. He can do no wrong, so no one must ever go against what he wishes. Denver obviously didn't know just how bad he would be at the time. I don't know what the Raiders' excuse is, though. Anyway, Josh and Jay did not get along. In fact, they fought so much that Josh just straight up sent him packing. They traded him for Kyle Orton of the Bears, along with some picks, just to get rid of him. Now, I'm aware that Cutler's attitude was never... great. But a franchise quarterback is extremely hard to come by. Just take a look at McDaniel's Broncos to see that. But that's far from the end of the Cutler controversy. Like I stated earlier, Cutler developed somewhat of a reputation over his career as someone who just didn't care enough about the sport. And when you're the franchise quarterback, that doesn't work. So when Cutler left in the biggest game of the 2010 season, fans and other members of the NFL were quick to jump all over him. They said he gave up on the team, that he didn't fight through the injury, that he didn't want to. And because his team lost, those voices were emphasized even more, whether it was fair or not. There was also the small pick problem. In 2009, Cutler led the league with 26 interceptions. In 2010, he cleaned it up a little bit, but still threw 16. That means during his first two years with the Bears, Cutler had an interception rate of 4.3. Despite the picks, the Bears were confident in Cutler. After all, it's difficult to find a franchise quarterback. Just look at the Bears themselves. Outside of Cutler and Sid Luckman, it's kinda sad. So, headed into 2011, it was Cutler's team. And it was one that was teetering on the edge of greatness. Week 1, the Bears took on the Atlanta Falcons. The game started with a flurry of field goals from both teams before late in the third quarter, when Cutler hit tight end Matt Spath in the end zone for a one-yard touchdown. On the ensuing Falcons' possession, a fumble would be recovered by all-proud linebacker Brian Erlacher for a touchdown. That extended the Bears' lead. The Bears' defense balled out in the opener. In fact, the only touchdown scored by the Birds came courtesy of Jay Cutler, who found linebacker Croy Bierman open, who promptly ran half the field back for a pick six. Still, it was a decisive victory for the Bears. Week 2 was the same script but flipped. No, seriously, even the score was basically the same. Despite not throwing a pick in this one, Cutler got sacked six times as the Bears completely failed to get any kind of rhythm offensively. The Bears did score first, but by half they were already down 16-10. to Bears kicker Robbie Gold did hit a 38-yard field goal at the beginning of the second half, but that would be the last Bears score of the day. 
Robert Meacham and Darren Sproles capped off the beautiful offensive display the Saints had that afternoon. Week 3 was somehow simultaneously both a closer game and a more definitive loss for the Bears. The final score of 27-17 is less of a gap in terms of score, but the difference in this one was the Bears didn't score first. The Packers did. In fact, once they obtained the lead, they never relinquished it. Two Jermichael Finley touchdowns put the pack up early, and another one in the fourth quarter put this one to bed. The Bears' offense was very one-sided. The passing attack was mostly fine, despite a pair of picks, but it was the run game that would fail them this time. Their leading rusher was Jay Cutler, who, by the way, had 11 yards all game. Matt Forte only had two. Two. That's why they lost their first division match of the year. The next game was a bounce back, at least for Matt Forte. Cutler had by far his worst game of the season up until that point. Fortunately for the Bears, the Panthers had no answer for their ground attack. Forte must have been pent up from their last game because he went scorched earth. 25 carries, 205 yards, a rushing touchdown, and 25 receiving yards. Yep, I would say that is a successful day at the office. Week 5 was a revenge game. Oh, but not for Chicago, no. For Matthew Stafford. Let's flash back a minute. 2010 opening day. Chicago was hosting division rival Detroit. Stafford was entering just his second year in the league, and with his first year being cut short by the Browns, you better believe he was looking forward to getting going once more. Instead... Sacked. The ball is loose. And all the way down to the 22 penalty flags all over the field. The hit was made by Julius Peppers to jar and lose. Tommy Harris picked it up. Stafford appears to be shaken up. Boy, and that's not a good sign. That's his throwing arm. That hit effectively ended Stafford's season. Sure, he did come back later in the year, but in an overtime loss versus the Jets, he re-injured the same shoulder. This time, it had to be surgically repaired, so his season was officially done. Now, back in 2011, Stafford showed the Bears who they had messed with. He hooked up with Calvin Johnson five times for 130 yards and a touchdown. The Bears did at one point hold the lead, but a Brandon Pettigrew touchdown along with a massive Javid Best run, you remember him, ended Chicago's chance at their first win in the division of the season. Headed into next week, the Bears were now below 500, and they were desperate for another win. Not just because of their record, but because of who their opponent was, the Vikings. Already with three division losses, the team couldn't really afford to lose another one. Luckily, the game was never really close. By the end of the first quarter, the Bears already held a 16-0 lead. The Vikes started Donovan McNabb, you know, the Viking. Just saying that, you should know how bad that went. The dude was sacked five times. Two days later, the Vikings announced that McNabb was no longer the starter. Safe to say, the Bears won. Their final game before the bye week was one that they eked out a close one against the Bucks. And during the game, both clubs were 3-3. Three three. The Bears controlled the game early, if you don't count the safety. In the fourth quarter, though, the game got close. The Bucks scored a two-yard touchdown to a man who I will not show, then hit a 24-yard touchdown pass to Desmond Briscoe to bring the game to within three with just seven minutes on the clock. Unfortunately for Tampa, their offense shut down after this, and a late-game field goal by Robbie Gold secured another victory for the Bears. Week 9 was in Philadelphia. Coming off of the bye, the Bears were well-rested and jumped out to an early 10-0 lead. This is where complacency comes back to bite you in the ass. The Bears' offense shut down and the defense got tired. The Eagles, led by Michael Vick, came crawling back. Chicago was still up at halftime thanks to a late half-score by Marion Barber. The third quarter was Eagles domination, mostly via the ground game. Both LaShawn McCoy and Ronnie Brown, yes, that Ronnie Brown, scored in the quarter. The Bears were content with a lone field goal. The Bears' offense finally woke up in the fourth, and Earl Bennett caught a five-yard touchdown to give the Bears the lead once more. Fast forward to the end of the game, and the Bears tacked on another field goal as the Eagles' offense stalled, and the Bears escaped with a win. Week 10 wasn't even a contest. The Bears were out for blood against the Lions for what they had did earlier in the year. Their defense studied the Lions, and their somewhat predictive offense was stuffed for one of the only times all year. Stafford had his worst game of the season. He was baited into four picks, all by different defensive players. That's on top of Megatron and his sidekick fumbling two different possessions away. The Bears' amazing defensive effort helped mask the so-so game by Cutler, and a massive 37-13 win was the result. All of a sudden, the rocky start the team got off to seemed like it was in the past. Their next game was against the not-so-formidable Chargers, and it would be another easy win for the Bears. Next to nothing went wrong. I said next to. Yes, on a play that Cutler had already thrown a pick on, he tried to 
tackle Chargers defensive back Anton Kaysen. It did not go well. Cutler broke his thumb on his throwing hand. I don't know if you know this, but thumbs are important to quarterbacks. Because the injury required surgery, Cutler was ruled out for the rest of the year. The 7-3 start the Bears were off to was over. Without Cutler, the team relied on a mix of Caleb Haney and Josh McCown with predictable results. The team would lose five straight. In the middle of this losing streak, by the way, was a game smack in the middle of Tebow mania. For those that remember, 2011 was the year that Tim Tebow had a miraculous stretch of games where he played like shit but through some pure bullshit and excitement would find some way to win the game. The Bears outing was no exception. The game was sent to overtime, tied at 10. Yes, it's as boring as it sounds, but the Bears had a chance to kick a field goal late in the game. Instead, Caleb Haney botched a routine spike because he backed up too much, which caused an intentional grounding penalty. Let's just say this, combined with a super ugly game the following week against Seattle, relegated Haney to bench status once more. The final two games of the Bears were quarterbacked by Josh McCown. Were these good games? Oh god no, they were bad, but bad was good enough in week 17 because the Bears faced a team even more embarrassing than them at that point, the Vikings. What makes this game even funnier is the fact that Minnesota actually jumped out to a 10-0 lead in the first quarter and still lost, against a team that hadn't won since mid-November. Maybe I should make a video about how bad that Vikings team was. Anyway, the season that started with all the promise in the world ended like a nightmare. For all the shit Bears and NFL fans give Cutler, most of which is deserved by the way, this season was proof of just how important he was to them throughout his time in the Windy City. Sure, he might not have been a great quarterback, hell one could argue he wasn't even a good one, but the Bears needed him. He is the all-time leader in all Bears categories for a reason, because they don't have anyone else. And when you look at who they had after him... With the second pick in the 2017 NFL Draft, the Chicago Bears select Mitchell Trubisky, quarterback, North Carolina. Maybe Bears fans owe Cutler an apology. Then again, maybe not.